I think food is the ultimate vehicle for as an expression of our nature and our being. When I'm cooking, I try to have an intent for how I want people to leave the table. So not what I'm going to feed them. So I don't, you know, the frustration it is for people to, to think what's for dinner. Mm -hmm. I tend to try to think, how do I want people to go to bed tonight? Like, what do I want them to feel like? Or, or what thoughts do I want them to have about what happened at the table? And it's usually about community and contact and, and, and love. Like, I think that's, you know, it's something we all, it's a nutrient. It's part of the nourishment of life is to know that somebody loved you in making the food that you're eating. And that's why a takeaway meal, it doesn't have the, you don't get the same satisfaction. I think satisfaction comes from knowing at any level that yes. somebody gave a damn. From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey, everybody. I'm your host, Hilda Labrador. This is episode 216, and our guest is Holly Davis. Holly lives in Sydney, Australia, where she is a teacher, a whole foods chef, and the author of Nourish and Ferment. Today, Holly explains her guiding principles in cooking, taste, texture, nourishment, simplicity, and beauty. A conversation around the various facets of cooking and eating seemed particularly apropos to us with Thanksgiving right around the corner, and we covered so much ground today. Among other things, we touch on how our actions, our attitudes, and not just the foods we eat impact nourishment, why intentional cooking tastes better than simple takeout, and how the five element theory relates to cooking. This conversation nourished me deeply, and I hope it does the same for you. Before we dig in, a shout out to our sponsors. This episode is brought to you in part by Grass-Fed Tallow by Ancestral Supplements. Ancestral Supplements makes New Zealand sourced, nose to tail organ meats, bone marrow, and tallow in simple, convenient gelatin capsules. Consuming tallow supports fertility, hormone health, and provides nourishment for growth and development. So you get healthy bones, teeth, gums, and skin. Visit AncestralSupplements.com to see what they can do for you. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. Trust Merchant Services, not your usual credit card processing company. Any U.S. business that takes credit cards, we facilitate that process experienced and nicer than other credit card processing companies, and with super low rates, Trust Merchant Services can help you. Reach out to Jessica at TrustMerchantService.com. Trust Merchant Services, not your usual credit card processing company. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Holly. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's so lovely to be here. <laughs> We're in your lovely home here in Sydney. This is Palm Beach, is it? Palm Beach. Also, it's known as Summer Bay on Home and Away, which is a kind of terrible, kind of kid's soap. A soap teenage, opera? So sort of teenage soap opera. And, and this is known as Summer Bay, but it's, its real name is Palm Beach. And it's heaven, isn't it? Absolutely. I, I feel so blessed to live here. I, I found my way here from England. I'd been in Australia for a few years, and then um, my business partner suggested I come and live here. I never looked back. So it's like 23 years ago. So I asked you this morning, where can I catch the sunrise? And you were like, just step outside that door. <laughs> and right there, coming, coming up in over. the ocean. Oh, yeah, fantastic. isn't it? And isn't it beautiful? It's beautiful. It's just, and it never gets old. <laughs> and then the cockatoos came around. Anyway, we could spend all day just talking about your home. But we're going to cut to food and your philosophy around it, I wanted to ask you first, right off the bat, what is the most amazing food you've ever tasted? I get asked that a bit. And I, I, I don't know if I've just got an incredibly short memory, but it's sort of usually the last thing I ate. <laughs> <laughs> we had broth, for, and I thought that was tasted incredible. I'm, maybe I'm very immediate. <laughs> but the most amazing thing I've ever tasted, I had... Um, I supported a friend 
when she was birthing. And after the birth, her sister came over and she made us scrambled eggs with butter. And at the time, I was quite macro and I didn't really eat a lot of dairy. And it is one of the most memorable foods I've ever eaten. It was unbelievable. And I have made eggs that way ever since. So I got her to show me what she did. And she basically put half a ton of butter in a pan. She whipped up a couple of eggs. She added nothing else except a little salt. Very softly scrambled them. I teach people that. Like, I actually teach it in class. <laughs> like, you can't this get is over. how you look, you know, because people overcook eggs. Yeah. And they have the most, ins- if they're good eggs, the most insane flavor and good butter. And she's now non dairy, and, I, and I'm the dairy queen. It's really quite funny. You went the other swapped. way. So, why is it so important to eat foods that actually taste good as opposed to just foods that are good for us? Oh, I, I, I think it's got to look good. And if it tastes good, it will seduce you to eat more of it. You know, if it's, if it's something with balanced, beautiful flavors, you'll be drawn to eat more of that good thing, I think. We shouldn't think. force ourselves to eat something that oh we just God, think is no. good for us. No. I, I mean, I happen to be fortunate that I love natto. Do you know what natto is? Yes, so, yes. Yeah, fermented soybeans, Japanese mm. fermented soybeans, and they're very strong flavoured and they do a bit like a blue cheese, really. And I'm fortunate to love that, but I don't suggest that people who don't love slimy and, and you know, blue cheesy eat that. I think mm. you find the things that you love that happen to be good for you. You know, there's a lot of choice. We have a whole lot of food groups to choose from to find the things that make our hearts sing. And often that's a cultural thing, I think. The foods that, that are ancestral to us, it, even if it's like way back, we have, a, I think there's like a body knowing and a body knowledge. Like if I eat, I think the first time I tasted sourdough bread, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Mm. There was something very primal about that. And, I, and it still really excites me. It's one of the things I'm quite passionate about is really good sourdough. Yeah, and I think for someone Asian, for instance, a bowl of rice will do that, whereas my heritage doesn't have that in its background, although I've eaten more brown rice than most people on the planet probably. (laughs) (laughs) There are many reasons to choose the things that we choose, and I definitely, obviously, am an advocate for choosing whole foods and for for choosing foods that that you're eating them in a form that is... um, most that you're getting the most nutrient from them in a form that's also the most digestible that's you know primarily what it's about but right. i think those foods you should want to eat them right right and so in your book nourish you talk about these different aspects of our food so that we can be deeply nourished taste is one of them talk to us about texture so texture so going back to that natto like uh-huh. it's a texture i love it's slimy it's got this long sort of mucusy thing and most people think that's a revolting texture <laughs> so that's also quite personal uh some people like dry food some people like things that are particularly crunchy i think if it's all about balance you need a balance of of all those things to have your meals be interesting and i don't think that means you've got to have every texture in every no. dish in every meal but I think over the course of a day, it's really great to have a variety of texture. Variety is key to our well-being in all sorts of ways, isn't it? Diversity, variety. Absolutely. And I'm thinking about that dish on the table last night. It had carrots and beetroot. And then I think Claire suggested we add some roasted or toasted walnuts. Yeah. And that really made it come alive because the textures were different even in that one dish. It, yes. And there was a little bit of, there's a little bit of vinegar on there. And a little bit of red wine vinegar and quite a good glug of really beautiful dark green olive oil, so grassy olive oil and a bit of salt and a bit of pepper. And that's it. So not a great deal. And that, the texture along with those flavors, like the carrots and beets are sweet. So to have a little sour to balance it out and a little salt to help balance the sour out, all of that. It makes sense. And we tend to do that innately, I think, or we have done traditionally, done that innately. And now because we have, we've lost our elders in terms of learning how to eat and how to put things together, people now have an interest in relearning that. But I think we can trust ourselves to know 
Like people will say, oh, I don't know what to put with what. But actually, I think if you if you apply the those sort of principles of, of balancing something out, if you've got something that's really soft, what could you add? Maybe you've got a, a really beautifully softly cooked something. What would add a, a contrast to that? So you're looking for contrast that complement each other. I like food to have complex flavour, but not complicated. So don't put everything in the pot. Complex, but not complicated. Yeah, I like that. So bring out the flavour, the innate flavour in something with the addition of a little of something else. You know what I've noticed lately is a lot of people have young children who don't like certain textures of food and become very particular about it. They don't yeah. like the way it feels in their tongue or their mouth. Yeah. What would you suggest to a, a mom who is struggling with a child who's particularly picky? And, and you're saying something about variety as well. What if the kid just wants to eat the same thing every day? What would you do? It's, it's definitely a challenge and sometimes there are some significant reasons for that preference, you know, so you might want to look into is this something kind of pathological? Is it like they absolutely won't? And I think, I think no is something that we've given up as parents and that we could bring back. I think that while, like my daughter at about the age of 12 said to me, Mom, I want to be vegetarian. And my answer to that was, I can't let you be vegetarian, but when, you, when you're cooking and when you're looking after yourself, you can make that choice if that's a choice that you still want to make. But while I'm in charge and I'm responsible for putting the food on, I, I'm going to give you what I believe will nourish you the best because that's my job. So I had friends who thought that was appalling, that I didn't allow her that expression. But I, I had a concern for her growth and her well-being that made that to me that was the right thing to do and that's all you can do as a parent is do what you think is is best I think but with the fussy eaters I think although it's frustrating I think provide variety put it on the table and see if you can encourage we had something we called the 20 taste rule you weren't allowed to say I don't like that until you tried something 20 times. Wow, that's such a high number. <laughs> it's such a high number. But I, I just last week was at a school with kids who are 10, and I was talking to them actually about taste. It's this beautiful initiative, initiative called the Week of Taste where chefs go into schools and they introduce children to tastes and textures. And I was saying to the kids, who here has a food that they don't like? And, you know, most of them had something they didn't like. He said, who here has a food that they used not to like and now they love it? And almost as many kids put their hand up. So you just point out to them that there are things that they didn't like that they, they now do. And you look for those things. You'll know as a mother what didn't they eat that they now do eat. You say, look, well, you never know. So don't tell me you don't like it. Say, I don't like it yet because you don't know at what point it will become your favorite food. And oh it does gosh, happen. That's great. I don't like it yet. That's <laughs> I don't awesome. like it yet. I don't like it yet, but I might tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's kind of that fickle. Sometimes it is that, like, simple. They just go, oh, yeah, I, wow, actually, that's my favorite thing. <laughs> that's so funny. So talk to us about another part of your philosophy. I see on your book cover here it says nourishment. Yeah, so I have, I have the words taste, texture, nourishment, simplicity, and beauty, and those are like my guiding principles, if you like. And so when I'm putting, catering for somebody or I'm teaching a class, I'm looking for how do I provide people with great flavor and diversity in all of those and bring it all together in terms of what's appropriate under the circumstances that somebody finds themselves in. So am I catering for a party or am I catering for someone who's unwell? What's the state of their teeth? I'm Big on, funnily enough, <laughs> big on teeth. I think uh, teeth are an incredibly important part of the whole thing. And it affects what textures that you could eat. You know, if you've got really poor dental health, there are some things that you just can't chew. And in terms of nourishment, if you want to get nourishment from your food, you need to be able to chew your food really well. And I think if your teeth are in any way compromised, which is sometimes by... I mean, there are many reasons that that can happen. Uh, it can be very young, can be very old. It can be somebody who's unwell, somebody who has 
you know, have lost their teeth. Mm -hmm. Then you eat more cooked food because cooked food's going to be easy for you to actually get nourishment from. So mm -hmm. nourishment, I think nourishment when it comes to eating is everything. I, I don't mean that getting nourished is everything. I mean everything that you do to put food on a plate or on the table has the opportunity to be nourishing for you and those around. Coming up, Holly tells us her secrets to creating nourishing experiences and why simplicity and beauty are included in her cooking philosophy. You're listening to the Wise Traditions Podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. This episode is brought to you in part by Grass-Fed Tallow by Ancestral Supplements. According to Cabeza de Vaca, the Native Americans are the people with the most well-formed bodies and the greatest vitality and capacity. What kind of foods produce such fine physical bodies, well-formed, strong, resistant to degenerative disease, and cavity-free? All were based on the nose-to-tail dining and fat. They hunted the older animals because they had built up a thick slab of fat along the back. Our DNA evolved with the nourishment of liver, heart, kidney, pancreas, spleen, and a whole lot of fat. The fat was always saved, sometimes by rendering, stored in the paunch, bladder, or large intestine, and consumed with dried or smoked meat or pemmican. Used in this way, fat contributed almost 80% of total calories in the diets of the northern Indians. Most prized was the internal kidney fat of ruminant animals. Consuming tallow supports fertility, hormone health, and provides nourishment for growth and development, healthy bones, teeth, gums, and skin. So visit ancestralsupplements.com to see what they can do for you. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. Trust Merchant Services, not your usual credit card processing company. Any U.S. business that takes credit cards, we facilitate that process. More affordable and nicer than other credit card processing companies. Trust Merchant Services has experience with a wide variety of U.S.-based businesses. Whether it's retail, restaurant, online, or a nonprofit business, Trust Merchant can help. Trust Merchant's rates are low and stay low. No contracts or termination fees. Customer service is unparalleled. Plus, Jessica gives 2% of the profits back to a not-for-profit every year. Reach out to Jessica through her website, TrustMerchantService.com. Trust Merchant Services, not your usual credit card processing company. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Well, and especially if they're whole real foods, right? Like if I get takeaway food from some fast food restaurant, I might be doing it, I don't know, to save time, but it might not necessarily be nourishing. So no. And the experience is not generally nourishing. Um, it's a much more nourishing experience to have a relationship at every step along the way. So I'm, I'm really for knowing who you get your food from, from finding people as much as is possible with where you live and what your budget is and everything else to engage with the people who are producing your food, to know where that food has come from, what soil was it grown in, what's important to the people that are growing and what's their life like. Are they able to eat the food that they're providing for you? Like, you know, because there's, that is an issue if we all want to eat quinoa and other quinoa farmers actually eating quinoa anymore, some of them aren't. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Here, I buy from someone who uses a group called the Irupana Collective and... Uh, and we grow quinoa here now in Australia, and I tend, oddly, I'm really all for local, and, yeah. but I don't buy local quinoa. I buy my quinoa where, where traditional quinoa growers are uh -huh. because it grows at a particular altitude, and it's been the knowledge that's in those communities who are producing it is far greater than the knowledge of the communities that are producing it here. And here, it's not washed to the same degree before you buy it and so it has more saponins on it which are one of nature's natural insecticides mm. makes it very difficult to digest like impossible horrible oh. and saponins an ingredient in soap so if you eat poorly washed quinoa you get that kind of soapy and it and it does it does that thing that a walnut will do to you where it makes your mouth feel weird mm -hmm. not not nice so, you know, I think there's reason to look further back for 
how something's being produced. Is it being produced where, where it's native to? Clearly, we're concerned about food miles and I use ingredients that come... I actually use ingredients that come from Japan because I have a really in, a big interest in Japanese food. Now, thankfully, there are people here making traditional Japanese foods so that I know that they've been made with organic Australian ingredients, which I, I like. So, you know, I'm... Um, What's the word? I, 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 hypocrite's the one I think, think of, but it's, that's not quite it. It's like I will cross my own values. You know, I, <laughs> I, I have values and I, and I uphold those values to a degree, but I bend them for particular reasons. Right. And I think do you we know what all I mean? Do. I, think, yes. I think we all do. We kind of do the best we can. But Yes, we do the best we can. And did I hear you correctly last night when we were preparing some beans for dinner, some string beans or something that you said to the friend, think... Thoughts of love while you're <laughs> shelling these beans. And I thought, were you serious about that? Do you think it's how we think as we're preparing food makes yeah, a difference? I, th- I think food is the ultimate vehicle for, as an expression of our nature and our being. And so I think how we be when we're doing what we're doing, I think it, I mean, it's just my feeling (laughs) i know there are people who think i'm nuts but i i yeah i absolutely think i think when i'm cooking i try to have an intent for how i want people to leave the table so not what i'm going to feed them so i don't you know the frustration it is for people to to think what's for dinner Mm -hmm. i tend to try to think how do i want people to go to bed tonight like what do i want them to feel like or or what thoughts do I want them to have about what happened at the table? And it's usually about community and contact and 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 love. Like I think that's you know it's something we all it's a nutrient. It's part of the nourishment of life is to know that somebody loved you in making the food that you eat. And that's why a takeaway meal it doesn't have the you don't get the same satisfaction. I think satisfaction comes from knowing at any level. That yes. somebody gave a damn, you know. Uh-huh. Somebody, somebody was actually considering your needs, considering what you like, what you don't like, offering you things you do and don't like. Try this. Have you tried this? Wow, I, you know, this is really amazing. What, like, what do you think? Mm-hmm. And not, not be upset if someone doesn't love it. You know, you don't have to love it. Uh-huh. But if I think, as a diner, we have an equal opportunity to be loving in how we respond to what's offered to us Mm -hmm. so you try it and you know be I think being straight about whether you like I'm fine with really you're going to feed me that (laughs) (laughs) you've had all kinds of reactions ox heart for dinner oh really (laughs) yeah not much just try it maybe it's time number 19 of their trying it and they'll like it the next time that's right (laughs) I don't like it yet Let's move on to the concept of simplicity. Mm. What does that look like for you? Well, it's a bit like the, the comment about you want complex flavor but not complicated. So allowing simplicity in terms of, I like five as a number. So there are five wor- words mm-hmm. across the top of the book. There, are, I like a dish and I'm not saying it must have, but I just like... I like odds, so I tend to. I, I may be sounding like a complete kook, but no, it's totally I like fine. <laughs> I like odds. I like to um, because I think that it matters to have uh, to put consciousness into what you're doing. Then to consider, you consider all aspects. You know, where am I? What What's the season? What's available to me? Who am I feeding? What are, you know? What are, is their condition? I mean, we think about that when we make a meal, Absolutely. even if we don't know that we do, but we mm-hmm. do. You know, we consider all those things. The idea of using either odds or even. So I might, in a dish, use three carrots and one clove of garlic and five of something else. So I, I actually consciously choosing the number. Not because the number matters, but because it means I've considered it. It's just a means for consideration. So I'm cooking odds tonight. I'm, I generally cook odd. <laughs> I like odd. I like odd numbers. It's, you know, in uh, Japanese sort of philosophy, odd numbers are chosen over even generally. Oh, like really? if you get a little package of anything, it'll have an odd number. So it'll be five of something or seven of something. It'll never be four or six. Oh, wow. I wonder if in the Western world they prefer... Yeah, we tend to, don't we? Yeah. You, you know, you get 12 biscuits, not 
11. Yeah. But so how does that play into simplicity? Because it's sounding a little complicated to me. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the things that get considered and they kind of, they just do. Like I, I don't have to do that. And then I, I choose the, if I've got the best ingredients, I can do the least amount to them. So the simplicity is in not having to overly work something, you know, to have a meal. Like the things that we had last night, they were food cooked quite simply, put together in particular ways to be interesting. You know, we ha what did we have? We had um, a little fennel in a bowl with a little bit of lemon zest. I put a little bit of salt on that and rubbed it so that the, that softened the fennel. And then I used that as the dressing for the leaves that went on top of it. A bit of bitter leaf, a bit of other green leaves, and then some really good olive oil so that we get the most nutrient from those beautiful greens. And that's pretty simple. It's, it takes five minutes to do. Like it doesn't take a lot of, lot of time. And it's just applying those kind of principles of how you balance flavors and textures mm -hmm. and colors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's all sort of there. But the end result is actually quite a simple dish but that has wow factor or is in some way sexy, like really good oil, really fresh, new seasons olive oil. Amazing. And it's amazing food. And you can put it on pretty much anything and it will make that thing sing. So whether it's a, a raw thing or a very lightly steamed thing, you know, the addition of that fat will not only provide its own nutrient, but it'll help you get the nutrients out of the other ingredients and it'll taste amazing. Absolutely. It really did. I can testify. <laughs> <laughs> and that leads us to our next principle, the one of beauty, because the table, I couldn't stop taking pictures. I felt so American. <laughs> uh, but everything <laughs> Australian in simplicity was so beautiful. And the conversation, the whole experience. So it wasn't, like you said, some takeaway where we were just trying to fill our bellies and move on so we could go do something else at a certain time. We were just relaxed and sharing the meal. And Yeah, that's, isn't that a lovely thing and that idea of you know I, I I don't really know you and to bring together some people that are more people you don't know <laughs> and to see where that goes and have food between us and be able to I love that thing of creating a meal and rather than putting everything on the plate putting it in dishes on the table so a people get the bit they can choose what they want to eat but also they can offer it to each other because in that offering there is beauty, there's, and there's an opportunity for connection and offering and receiving food is very primal and it's, not, I think it's deeply nourishing. And, and not so that you, I, mean, I don't think about these things generally. No, Do you know what I mean? Yes, it's not it's like, like I- second hand for you. In other yeah. words, it's, it's second nature, not second hand. <laughs> <laughs> second, <laughs> it is, it's second nature, but it's, I'm, I'm keen not to have another thing that we all have to do. Like I love five element theory and how that explains beautifully. And that's why I did that with the kids amazingly. In the school last week, I was explaining to them how you balance flavors and, and talking to them about the five elements. And I, I absolutely love that. But I, in the books that I've written, I've actually avoided trying to explain that because what I don't think we, any of us need is another thing we feel we have to do. You know, and I'm not suggesting that anyone else has to cook with five or you know, do what I do. Those are the things that I've adapted because they suit my being. You know, they, they right. speak to me. Well, and of course, now I want to ask you what the five elements are. <laughs> yeah, so the, yeah, so the five elements are tree or wood, fire, earth, metal and water. And they have... In traditional Chinese medicine, those five elements have what are called correspondences. So since we're talking about food, the color for wood is green and the flavor is sour. For fire, it's red and the flavor is bitter. Uh, for earth, it's yellow and the flavor is sweet. For metal, it's white and the flavor is pungent. Uh, so that's sort of spicy things, ginger, mm. raw onion, and then water, it's salty and black mm. or dark purple is the color or blue is the color of, of that. And the idea is that you put those on a circle, starting with wood, wood 
supports fire. That's an input that they're mm. important to each other. Fire creates earth. Earth creates metal. Metal. What does metal do to water? It supports water. Oh, puts minerals in the in, oh, the, okay. in the water. Uh -huh. And water obviously su supports wood. Mm -hmm. But then if you go from one to the one after the next one, yeah. that's its control. So yeah. when you're looking at flavors, if you drew a circle and you wrote those things out, you find that sour will control sweetness. Sweetness will control saltiness. Saltiness will control bitterness. Bitterness will control <laughs> pungent and pungent will control sour. So they're, they're supports and controls of flavor. And the idea is really not to go, oh my God, what's this doing? What's that doing? It's, it's when you're tasting, if you think, ah, wow, that's so sweet. And you know, you do think that you think, oh, wow, that's so sweet. What will I do? You add something a little sour and maybe you also add a little salt. You know, you, so you'd create balance that way. So you, you look for the, the one before or the, uh, the one opposite. Well, it sounds like a good tool for wrapping our head around how our foods work together and can balance I think each it, other. Out. I think it's actually, the trick is not to use your head, but mm -hmm. to just experiment with, mm -hmm. with those flavors. Like if you just think of those five flavors yeah. and you experiment with those and how they go together, when you make a dish and you think that it's a bit of one thing, add a bit of one of the others and see what happens and learn it that way. Like just, you don't have to learn, you don't, it's not cerebral. It's, yeah. it's kind of what nature does. So the whole idea of five element theory is it's a description for what's happening in life and how it relates. Right, right. And the order of the universe, one big life. Everything's got an opposite and everything turns to its opposite over time is the idea. Wow, that's fascinating. Now let's talk about the final principle about appropriateness that did not make the cover of your book Nourish. No. But is still so something that you consider when you're So though taste, texture, nourishment, simplicity and beauty are brought together in a way that is appropriate to the circumstances you find yourself in. So if you're so the idea of that when it's sort of described if if you're eating a traditional diet in a very cold climate. So if you were a traditional Inuit eating that diet, that's, that's what's appropriate for the circumstances that you found yourself in. And if you were a traditional Inuit, you were living on the snow and ice. So eating a very high fat diet with very, you didn't have access to much mm -hmm. in the way of greenery except something that you could ferment. That's kind of right for, for where you find yourself. And if you were on a tropical island somewhere, that was not an appropriate diet. And what's happened now, we have everything available to us all the time. We've forgotten about the seasons. We don't know, we don't know what's seasonal. And we don't want to know mostly. You know, we want strawberries all year round, which I think is really sad. So the seasonality is one level of what's appropriate, mm -hmm. what kind of, what your health is like, whether you've got compromised health. So if, if your health was compromised, then perhaps you're going to eat more cooked food than raw food depending on your philosophy there are many philosophies out there that people yes. have but that's according to mine if someone was sick and I cook for people who are unwell mm. um, who are suffering from serious life challenging illnesses with the idea of using food as, as as a form of medicine I'm looking for what's appropriate for the circumstances that person's in where are they what's the season what kind of treatment are they having what's that doing to their body what you know what does that person need and then we do that with a family if you have a family to feed you will be considering what's appropriate for all the members of that family and we try to find some commonality don't we yes it's like can I put could I please just make one meal and not you know five <laughs> so it's it's about that it's and it's employing those principles of taste texture, nourishment, simplicity, and beauty to provide something that works for as many people at the table as possible. Oh, wow, that's great. Well, you definitely did that last night, and I know that's your philosophy for nourishing in general. I want to wrap up now with a question I often pose at the end. I usually say if the listener could do one thing to improve their health, what would you recommend? But in this case, I might just ask, if the listener could do one thing to nourish themselves or their families, more deeply, what would you recommend that they do? Inspiration is often something that people ask. When I ask, why did you come to this class? It's often for ins inspiration. And I think in terms of nourishment, I, 
we're talking to an audience that is savvy about the, the, the nourishing traditions, but one I think really does make a difference and has made a difference for a lot of people that I've worked with is find a spot in your kitchen. Like you may already have this, but if you don't, find a beautiful chopping board. Find a board that you love, you know, something beautiful to chop on. Take your sharpest knife and be as present as you can with what you're doing when you're doing it. That's unbelievably nourishing so that you get you get some sense of satisfaction and joy. And the other thing I suggest people do is if you can put that board somewhere where you can see something beautiful, depends on the circumstances you live in. Sometimes, you know, I can look out there and that is extraordinarily beautiful any day of the week, any time of the year. If you don't have access to something like that, but you can bring inside a, a little plant or have something that grows in your kitchen, you know, put something that you consider beautiful. Sometimes it's just the fruit that you've bought or the vegetables that you've bought that you can see them where you're chopping. It's uplifting. It can be, you know, if you choose it to be, and it's a choice. But I, I think that's a means of nourishing. We need to nourish ourselves before we can nourish anybody else. So those things make, I have a collection of boards and I use different boards for different foods. Not because I want to keep Though, and there are occasions I want to keep things separate. You know, I want to keep my... I only use timber boards. I use those for meat and and everything else. So I tend to keep a board for meat and I keep a board for things that I don't want to taste of garlic. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a story for all the boards that I have. People have given them to me or I've seen them somewhere. And when I use them, I'm transported in some way. I'm not just in my kitchen. And I know that they produced for many people and I can consider. So sort of bringing yourself in to yourself before you try to go out, you know, with whatever it is you're making. I don't think that's nourishing. I hope it is. It sounds very nourishing. <laughs> it really does, Holly. Thank you for your time today. Oh, such a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Our guest today was Holly Davis. Find out more about Holly at foodbyhollydavis.com. You can find me on Instagram at Holistic Hilda. And for the show notes for this and every Wise Traditions podcast, go to our website, westonaprice.org, and click on the podcast page. And that's it. Thanks for listening, everybody. And have a happy Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for you. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.